What's up my stats stars? I'm Michael Prunchak and in this video, I wanna tackle some multiple choice questions to help prepare you for the AP Statistics exam. So in this video, I'm gonna present a multiple choice question. Go ahead and pause the video, try it on your own, see what you could come up with, and then hit play and I will very briefly go over the solution and the answer. All right, best of luck, hopefully you enjoy. All right, so here we go with the AP Statistics Practice Multiple Choice Questions Part 1. Here is question one. I'm going to go ahead and show it. You could pause the video, read it, try it on your own, and then hit play to see the answers and have me talk about it. All right, so the correct answer here is E. So again, this is a conditional question because they're asking us, you know, of the people who have insomnia. So, right, that's really, really important. That makes it conditional because we're only allowed to look at the people who have insomnia, and that's 1,268 people. So, of those people who have insomnia, what proportion drank caffeine? Well, that'd be the 487 out of the 1,268. So, it's a conditional probability question. Pretty, pretty easy to answer as long as you know how to read the table correctly. All right, question number two. And the correct answer is A. So we're clearly dealing with proportions in this problem. We're looking at the proportion of people who are going to be registered voters. And we have this belief that it's 63%. So that's going to be our null hypothesis. And then the alternative is kind of like what we're looking for. And they're, have, they're looking for evidence that it's more. That's the key word we're looking for right there. More than 63%. So the alternative is going to be the population proportion is 0.63. And the alternative is what we're looking to have evidence for and that's greater than 0.63. Now, notice that all the other choices don't quite have that exact thing. Notice that um, in B, C, and D, or excuse me, B, D, and E, we don't have equal signs. The null hypothesis should always be an equal sign for AP statistics. And the alternative can be greater than, less than, or not equal to. And how do you know? You kind of have to read the problem to answer that. So there you go. Hopefully not too bad. And question number three. All right, the correct answer here is A. So this is a classic question, just making sure that you understand what standard deviation represents. Standard deviation is the approximate distance that the values in your data set are from the mean. So think of it as like an average. It's an average distance that the individual students are from the mean number of days attended for all students. The other ones just don't quite sound correctly, nor do they make sense based on what we've learned about standard deviation. And question number four. All right, so this question is a basic describe the sampling distribution. Now, the correct answer here is E, but let's make sure we really understand why. So in the population, we know that the mean is 6.7 minutes. The standard deviation is 2.1 minutes. And we also know that it's definitely not normal. They tell us that it's kind of skewed. Now, the question is asking about a sampling distribution based on looking at many, many, many samples of size 100. So here we got to think about the center. The center is the mean of all those possible sample means, which we should be the truth, right? Now, not every sample is going to be 6.7. Some sure are going to be more. Some are going to be less. But we would expect the mean of all those samples of size 100 to be equal to the 6.7. Next up is the standard deviation. Now, 2.1 is the standard deviation for any one individual within the population, but for sampling distribution to get the standard deviation for how the samples are gonna vary, we're gonna take that population standard deviation of 2.1 and divide it by the square root of our sample size, and that gets us 0.21. That's the one thing that a lot of students get wrong is they forget about that. Bigger samples vary less, so yes, an individual could vary by as much as 2.1 minutes, but a sample of 100 should not vary as much, which is why it has a much smaller standard deviation of 0.21. And finally, the shape. Because our sample size is greater than or equal to 30, central limit theorem says that the sampling distribution of the sampling distribution for X bar will be normal. So that's why the correct answer here is going to be E. And question number five. All right, so the question answer, the, the correct answer here is E, all of them. Now, they want us to know which of the following is a potential source of bias. The first one says residents without internet access may be underrepresented in the poll results. Absolutely. If you don't have an internet access, then you never could go to the website. So that's a potential problem, right? That can underrepresent those types of people. Number two says only residents who have strong opinions may choose to participate in the poll. Yeah, it's not random, right? You have to access the website on, on your own. 
and respond on your own. It's basically a volunteer survey. It's up to you to go into the website and do it. And typically the types of people that are going to volunteer to go and give their opinions are people that have really strong opinions one way or the other. And the third one says the opinions of residents who visit the website might not reflect the views of the entire city population. That's of course true because it's not random. We didn't randomly select people from the population. So the people that actually visit the website, yes, they're responding and that's great. We're going to get their opinions. But remember, there's certain types of people that are going to openly go and seek out to do a survey. And those opinions may re not reflect what's true for the entire population. So some classic issues there with sampling bias. All right, question number six. All right, and the correct answer here is E. So basically we have a sample of 120 trees and we found out that we measured them wrong. So every single measurement needs to be reduced by two meters. We're taking all of the values in our data set and we're gonna subtract two meters from them. Now, this will affect the median because the median is going to go down too. This will affect the mean because the mean is going to go down too. Again, addition or subtraction of a constant affect measures of center like median and mean. The third quartile and the first quartile are measures of position. So they're also going to go down too. Again, addition, subtraction, affect measures of center and measures of position, but they do not impact measures of spread. The entire data set is going down too. That is not going to change the spread of the middle 50%, which is the IQR or the interquartile range. Same would be true for the range and standard deviation. So measures of spread are not impacted by the addition or subtraction of a constant to the data set. Question number seven. All right, the correct answer here is B. So here we are looking at a random sample of 200 households and we're gonna calculate the sample median. Now, what do we know is true about the population median? Well, A is wrong, just, you know, your sample median is gonna vary, right? A sample median, a median from a sample is not gonna match the population median. It could be less, it could be greater than, it's not gonna necessarily be equal to it. And now B is correct because what they're saying is that the sample median, since it was a random sample, should be an unbiased estimator of the population median. That's the whole idea of sampling. As long as it's random and you don't have any bias, it should be an unbiased estimate of the population median. C says the sample median will always be higher than the population median. That's not true. Technically, 50% are probably going to be above it and 50% are probably going to be below it. The population median can be accurately determined from a single sample. Uh, that's not true. Samples vary. Just because you get a value from a sample called a statistic, it's not going to match the population parameter exactly. And E says the sample median is less reliable than the sample mean in estimating the population median. No, if we're estimating the population median, the sample median would be the most reliable source to try to estimate it, not the sample mean. So not too bad of a question, but just make sure you really read the choices and think about them carefully. And question eight. The correct answer here is A. This is a classic normal distribution problem. So thank goodness it says that the data falls in normal distribution with a mean of $38,400 and a standard deviation of $4,000. Now we gotta be really careful because a lot of kids misunderstand the word at most. At most 30,000 means 30,000 or less. So trying to find the proportion or probability that the tuition is less than or equal to 30,000. A lot of kids see the word most and they automatically think greater than, but that's not the case. At least would mean greater than, that'd be 30,000 or more, but at most means 30,000 or less. All right, so now all we gotta do is get the Z-score for 30,000 based on the normal distribution with our mean and standard deviation. So we're gonna take 30,000 sorry for my messy handwriting here, subtract the 38,400 and divide by the standard deviation. And if you do that properly, get negative 2.1. So we're looking at a normal distribution and we're looking at the probability or the proportion of Z-scores that are less than negative 2.1. Now you could grab a normal table to do that or you could use your NumWorks, your TID4 calculator. However you have learned to do normal calculations, we're looking for Z-scores, the proportion of Z-scores less than negative 2.1. And of course that comes back at 1.79%. Nice and easy. All right, question number nine. 
All right, the correct answer here is B. This type of problem throws a lot of students off because it is a matched pairs t-test for the mean difference. Now, why is it a matched pairs test? Because there was one group of 30 participants. Now, we did not have 15 do one thing and 15 do something else. If that was true, it would be a two sample t-test. But what we had was everybody do both things twice, right? Everybody did both treatments. So the 30 participants were asked to perform a series of reaction times twice one after a full night of sleep and one after 24 hours of sleep deprivation. So everybody did it. Now, what order did they do it? That was random. And that is an important part of all experiments. But the end of the day is we're going to have 60 measurements, but they're from the same group of 30. So we're going to have 30 people. We're going to have a measurement of the reaction time with sleep and then a measurement of the reaction time without sleep, which means those times are going to be linked together. They're going to be matched together. So essentially all we really care about is the differences. So we have all 30 people scores with sleep and we have all 30 people scores with no sleep and what we care about is the difference between those for each of those 30 participants and that allows us to do a matched pairs t-test for a mean difference so i know this is not asked but the null here would be that the mean difference is equal to zero so we'd assume there's no difference and the alternative well that would be that the mean difference is well we'd have to kind of read the question see more what it says but if you know you would think that your action time with sleep would be faster, right? Wouldn't you? You you would hope. So that means that we're actually going to be looking for a difference less than zero because if sleep is faster, when we do sleep minus no sleep, you're probably going to get a negative result. And that means we're we're looking to show that when you sleep, you have less reaction time. Now, if you do that in the other order, then you'd be looking for greater than zero. But hopefully that question made sense. It does stump a lot of kids, so be very careful with that. And finally, question number 10. And the correct answer here is D. So this is another classic problem, kind of similar to one we actually saw earlier, where we had to understand how does addition, subtraction, multiplication, division affect your mean and your standard deviation. Now, I've already mentioned earlier that the mean is impacted by addition of a concept, but it's also impacted by multiplication. So we can think of it as this, multiplication affects all values, measures of center, measures of spread, measures of position, but addition and subtraction do not impact measures of spread. So we think about how is the mean going to change? Okay, well, the mean was 10. So we're going to do 3 plus 2 times 10. The multiplication of 2 is going to affect the mean, and so is the addition of that constant. So we get 23. But when it comes to the standard, oh, this should be the, the mean of y there, sorry. When it comes to the standard deviation of y, the addition of the 3 does not impact measures of spread. So we're just going to take that standard deviation of 2.5 and multiply it by 2 to get 5. We would not add the 3 to a measure of spread like standard deviation, range, or IQR. So that's why the correct choice there is D. All right, that's it for part one, looking at 10 multiple choice questions. Hopefully they were a nice little review to kind of get you ready for the AP exam. But don't forget to stay tuned because part two with another 10 multiple choice questions will be coming out. Best of luck on the AP exam. Hope everybody does well.